Prima. The biggest problem we had was by the time we get to film the Christmas episode, we're filming in July and August. So the first thought we had was, well, what about the glorious 12th and then going to Scotland? We've already established that the Ranthams have got Scottish relatives, so we developed a story around the idea of coming uh, for the uh, deer stalking season up to Scotland. They very seldom got out of Downton. They very seldom ever got away from the village or the area where they were brought up, and suddenly here they are in Scotland. And it is an incredible change of surroundings. And here, a big castle, they're probably quite used to large houses, but out they've gone, and hearing the sound of guns going off, it was a different world, and for them, a great excitement. It was great. <laughs> um, it, was, it was just brilliant, actually. We, we had such a good time. It was like a holiday. We film about a third at Highclere Castle, a third at Ealing Studios, and then a third is other assorted locations. But we haven't done as, as big an away location as this before, so this, this has broken the, broken the mould a little bit. Through Alistair, our wonderful um, historical advisor, he introduced us to the Duke of Argyll, who owns Inverera Castle, and there we went. Inverary here was built by the Campbell family, not for defence, but for glory. And the Campbell family is one of the great clans of Scotland. And so it was quite right that a duke should build a massive fortress to celebrate his position, wealth and power in the area. When I first saw it, I thought it's like one of those fairy tale castles, you know, it's like something from a Disney movie. And it's very different to the English houses like Downton, it's completely different. Scotland has got this very paternal atmosphere between the owner and those who work there, which goes back to the days of the chief and those who were in the clan. And so once every now and then, they have this Gillies Ball, where they have this coming together of the family with the staff. There were dance rehearsals, and they're a great way of bonding and breaking the ice, because everybody's making a fool of themselves together. It looks very nice, your ladyship. Yes, well, it's not right now, but we're trying our best. We all had to learn how to, to reel. I think Peter, my father, um, found it the, the hardest. He was so funny. When I watch the final thing, I think I'm very much standing on the shoulders of Diana, uh, a brilliant choreographer. They're all extremely willing, I have to say, very enthusiastic about, about doing the work. You know, we've got some, some really good stars. I'd love to bring them on to a higher level. For some reason, every job that I've done, I've never had the opportunity to dance, even when there has been some sort of dancing. Um, and so I was delighted when, you know, Diana told us that Mary would actually be dancing and kind of leading that dance with Matthew. Oh, we must all join in. Not me, my lady. I have a cast iron alibi. I can manage an eightsome and the dashing white sergeant, but that's about it. Well, I'm very good. Hamilton House is my favorite, but I can do most of them. You won't be trying any of them tonight. Spoil sport. Because she is the belle of the ball every year, because she loves dancing, she insists upon it, even though she's eight months pregnant. Um, which, of course, brings on the labour, actually, because I think all the jiggling around eventually brings it on. I think Mr. Crawley's right, my lady. Will you stay out of it? We'll have to see. <laughs> I wanted to introduce Rose at the end of the series and then bring her back for the Christmas special preparatory to going on with her in series four um, to have a new young girl. I thought she had to be a reasonably close relation. A daughter of a first cousin is a reasonably close relation in my book. Lady Rose is a young 18 year old sort of fresh. Uh, I think she's very enthusiastic about life and sort of grabs life <laughs> a bit too full on in some respect. Rose's evening had a bumpy start. I'm afraid Susan isn't herself. Parenting a child is bad enough when you like each other. Lady Rose represents the sort of beginnings of the bright young things of the 20s, um, which, you know, Mary, Edith and Sybil haven't really, you know, none of us really have, have had the chance to do that. I was told she's uh, a wild, um, the sort of naughty cousin from London who comes to the country to be tamed. <laughs> so that was sort of the character breakdown I was given. Oh, dear poor souls. It's nice to have a character that sort of storms in and represents that 
that period. Rose is, you know, she's she's not much younger than Sybil. She is a sort of um, reminder of Sybil for everyone. You know, she's quite a modern young girl, which Sybil was. Cora, she gets emotional when she's talking about Lady Rose because it reminds her so much of Sybil. No, oh, but she's absolutely herself. That's the problem. I think the isolation of Dun Eagle it has a sort of plot role in several different ways, actually. I think it does seem isolated for a young girl, and we know she's been punished in eight by being sent up there with her Aunt Agatha. But I think its isolation is also to do with giving Robert a false sense that the world has gone away, the horrible world of the 20th century, in this paradisical place where, you know, the piper wakes him up and the, and the gill is this and the something that. What I wanted from it was this sense that Robert had been transported to fairyland, except in the end it wasn't fairyland. And action. We filmed this luncheon scene after the, the men had all gone hunting. Uh, right by this lock. I mean, you couldn't have made a more picturesque setting. I mean, there was sort of white tablecloths, this beautiful marquee, all this amazing food, wicker chairs, um, <laughs> rolling countryside. It was also, you couldn't move for want of being attacked by midges, and we all had these sort of, like, huge nets over our faces. Midges are quite fierce in Scotland, that's for sure. Um, and they were fierce then, and of course, wherever we seem to be, we seem to be near water. So, yeah, I mean, that's all you do. You just happy, you take lots and lots of midgy cream and those nets and get on with it. Our first AD, Chris Croucher, had literally sprayed the midgy spray all around the table. So it was literally like this ring of, like, you know, our territory around the table just to get rid of them. There were bugs everywhere. Um, so everyone was just doing this the whole way through the scene. But it was really funny doing a scene and then out the corner of my eye seeing, you know, our boom operator with a big, you know, net over his head. It was just a really different environment to, you know, what we know of Highclere and Ealing Studios. It was, it was completely different. Because the family go away at Christmas and we're left to our own devices, there's a little bit of a relaxing happening of, you know, the normal routine. I put an order in with with Lord Fellows, and I said, I would like it if you could just, you know, bring along a bit of love interest for Mrs P. And um, it's taken quite a long time, but, it, but he came. Uh, it's, it's quite true that Leslie did request a romantic storyline. She's a normal human being with feelings, and she's never, not had any attention like that. I think we worked it out. There's a reference in the script about when she last went on a date and it was something like 30 odd years ago. Well, Mr Tufton has taken over our local shop and he's a bit of a flirty pants, which shocks us sideways really because I don't think people flirt with Mrs Batmore. I thought what would be interesting too is to see the servants when they're left alone, you know, when the cat is away, how do the mice play? Country fairs where you know, you could have fun for very little because there, w there wasn't an entry ticket. You only spent as much as you wanted to spend, which was very appealing for country people. A lot of the downstairs uh, team are taking part in a tug of war whilst also enjoying all the fun of the fair here, just outside downtown. I haven't been on the carousel yet, and I will before the day is finished. I insist that's going to happen. The swingy chairs look a bit vomit-making to me, and I did have a fantastic go in the boat with Mr Tufton. We're properly going for it, yeah. I wouldn't mind, but they put this guy, he's literally a tank, on the other side. You can see him there, I don't know if you can see him in the background. He's huge, he's about two people. He was a mon monster of a man, he was like Popeye times three. And he was, he was like their anchor. <laughs> Thankfully we have Matt, who's about seven foot six. We have Ed, who's just, you know, his good looks are, are strength on, on, on their own. And Rob James Collier, who's Rob, you know? God love him, we're kind of, let's be honest, he's the oldest. He's got the creakiest knees. He's, we're just holding him up, really. We really are. And action! Gentlemen, take the strain! Pop! Come on, let's go!
And Downton is now safe. Um, the baby's on the way, hopefully a boy. Um, yeah, they're, they're in a very kind of settled place now. Mary's really happy for the first time, I think. You know, she's a very contrary young woman, but at that point in the Christmas special, I think she is genuinely blissfully happy. I felt that was quite important to let the audience have that moment with them. No one got the Christmas special script uh, till really late on, and everyone read it and, and was like, whoa. You know, I was very sad to kill off Matthew. I was very, very sad. I mean, I'm not going to pretend otherwise. It is gut-wrenching. None of us wanted it. Um, and we're very conscious that this is happening on Christmas night. Well, I am the Grinch, really. Although I'm also the good fairy, you know, you, you, you bring the, the blessings as well as the um, bad luck. And I think it was very, very, very important that Mary and Matthew had their baby first and they could have that very, I find, very moving moment between the two of them um, before that happens. I mean, it is a bit of a down day because last year everyone kind of rolled away from the television and, uh, you know, and had another eggnog and everything lovely and then fall into bed. But this year, I think, <laughs> slightly different response to the, to the special. But, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. And I, I do believe we have to leave Mary with the memory and the sense of a perfect love. Good night.